Okay, so as we prepare for this lecture on blizzards, I want to walk back through our understanding of how the temperature profile of the atmosphere leads to the different types of precipitation. Remember, we're in a lecture series where we're trying to understand the difference between rain, freezing rain, sleet, and snow. So check this out. This is a forecast sounding. In other words, our computer models that forecast the weather can produce well, vertical profiles of the atmosphere. Now what you're looking at here is a skew T log P diagram, and that's a little different than what I've shown you so far this semester. But it's pretty easy to understand. You still have your temperature line and your dew point temperature line. But the difference is now all of the lines are a little bit skewed to the right. Now what does all that mean? Well, I'll just make it simple. Everywhere that I've shaded in this kind of uh, pinkish color, the see-through red, that's where on this diagram the temperatures are above freezing. So here we're looking at the temperature line, you can see it right here, and the dew point temperature line, which are touching one another throughout most of the sounding, except for right in through here. They separate again at the top. Now here's my question. It's Monday, February 19th, and you see this sounding, okay, in the forecast. What type of precipitation would you expect in Champaign? Now, if you're completely lost, I understand, because this is the first time I've shown you a diagram that looks quite like this. Let me help you figure this out. Well, if this is the temperature profile of the atmosphere, and this is the dew point temperature profile of the atmosphere, we know that the surface is right down here. And this line here represents our freezing line. So this side of it is above freezing, and that side is below. Now what I see is the temperatures below freezing, way starting at the top here, below, 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 and then right here it crosses. It becomes above freezing. And from there all the way to the ground, the temperature is above freezing. And as a consequence, this sounding will produce rain in Champaign, Illinois. Now, check this out. This is Madison, Wisconsin. A little bit different look here. You see the temperature profile, which again is this line over here, and again, this one over here is the dew point temperature line, all right? Can you see this? The temperature's cooling. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a below freezing right in through here. And there's a little pocket right in there where from this point all the way down to that point, I'll color it in a little bit, we have a melting layer, see it? And then down here, a surface sub-freezing layer. Do you see the sandwich effect? Below freezing above, melting layer in between, and the surface sub-freezing layer near the surface. That's right, Madison, Wisconsin on this day will be getting freezing rain. Now why not sleet or snow? Well the reason why it won't get snow is because you get some melting of the snowflakes once it gets into this uh, above freezing layer, right? Why not sleet? Well this is a deep, a deep freezing layer. See how deep it is? It's not shallow. And you're not going to get rain because the surface temperature is 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and therefore that's pretty cold. So, just some practice. Now, what we're going to dig into today, though, is the blizzard. Now, see how this all played out. On this particular day, Champaign-Urbana was right here, and they had us forecast for rain. See the greens up here? These greens represent rain. But Madison, Wisconsin is right there, and they're in the pinks where they were going to be getting freezing rain. So you saw the differences between the two soundings, Madison, which I'm circling here, versus Champaign-Urbana, which I've circled down here. If I would have shown you another sounding way up north in northern Wisconsin up here, the whole thing would have been below freezing and it would have represented snow conditions. But like I said, today it's all about the blizzard. And check out this video. This video was shot a few years ago, I think it was 2011 in Ohio. Now what you're watching here is a time lapse. You can see the time ticking away on that clock down there. This person set up a clock out here watching, uh, set up a clock and a video camera and watch the snow just pile up. Now look at this. What you're seeing here is 40 inches of snow in 24 hours. 40. Now that's an enormous amount of snow. By the way, normally in Champaign-Urbana, we on average for an entire winter season get 26 inches of snow. So if we were to get this much snow like you just saw here in one winter storm, that would smash records for Champaign-Urbana. Well, speaking of records, I want to talk just for a moment about one of the snowiest places in the United States. I'm going to take you to the end of Lake Ontario. So Lake Ontario is here, so you're in upstate New York, so we're right in this area. And this little area right in here, I'll circle it for you. This is called the Tug Hill Plateau. 
and annually this place receives between 200 and 300 inches of snow. And that's because you get these bands of lake effect snow that come off of Lake Ontario. Now in this lecture we're not going to focus too much on how lake effect snow forms. We'll save that for other lectures. What we want to do here is we just want to talk about what big time snowfall amounts look like. Now here's the record. From February 3rd to February 11th in 2007, okay, we had a lake effect snowstorm called Locust. You see, they name lake effect snowstorms, and this one was named after a bug, lake effect snowstorm Locust. And it put down nearly 12 feet of snow in eight days. 12 feet of snow. I mean, it's just incredible to imagine that much. Well, if you need to see it, I can show you what some of it looks like. This is what some snow looks like in our lake effect snow bands. There you go. That guy had to shovel off his roof, pile it up in the front yard, but you got drifts up here that are well over 12 feet tall. Here's another picture of someone shoveling off the roof. By the way, if you live in a region that gets heavy, heavy snow uh, and your roof collapses under the weight of the snow, you should know that your homeowner's insurance policy does not cover it if they found that your roof had more than 50 pounds per square feet of snow on it. Your homeowner's insurance is null and void. But again, some of these places just get enormous, enormous amounts of snow. Uh, check this out. You've got these people that carved a path to their swing. This woman out here carving a path to I don't know where. Here she is shoveling snow well over her head. And this person drove a snowmobile from the snowbank onto the roof of their cabin or their house. Amazing to see that. And this lady, I love this. She went and dug out all of the snow just to get into her hot tub. Uh, so amazing to see what some of these deep snowfall amounts look like in these lake effect snow bands. You might open your door and see a five and a half foot drift. Or I don't know where this person was possibly going to be blowing all the snow to, but it doesn't look like it's going Going anywhere fast and I believe this is like a, a vending machine that they kind of carved out here Maybe it's like a coke machine or something I'm not sure uh, but it's still buried in snow some places on our Great Lakes get even more snow than this and some of these pictures are actually over from lake effect snow events uh, in other parts of Europe but you can just see how deep the snow can pile up in some of these locations back in the US look at this snow piled up covering burying houses entirely incredible to see this amount of snow and uh, from this one lake effect snow event where we got 12 feet, this is early in the storm system when it was only about four feet deep. Just amazing to see what that looks like. I love this picture because this is though this guy, you know, had cleaned off his car or his truck here. And by the time he got, you know, everything cleaned off, you know, the big mountain of it snow still sticking his roof. Probably just, you know what, screw this. I don't have time. And just got in and started driving off. Maybe it kind of caved off like a big avalanche as he was driving. And this person you can see clearly having to kind of cleave off the snow from the roof just to protect the house. And just some final pictures here. Look at this. We've got, uh, you know, getting rid of snow. Where are you going to put it? I mean, it's just, it's just everywhere. Uh, just a massive mess. And a word to the wise here. If you're going to be um, getting your vehicle out of the garage, knock the snow off after you have the vehicle out so that you can uh, still get it back out. And imagine this. This is a, a basically a bus stop just completely surrounded in snow. And I love this picture because these two guys are actually shoveling off the roof of their uh, two-story house so that their kids could climb up to the top and sled down it. So that's, that's pretty cool. Now, remember this, okay? We just saw some crazy pictures here. Remember this. When it comes to a blizzard, there is no snow depth requirement. You just have to have snow. But sometimes when we have these great lake effect snow events where the cold air moves across the warm lake and picks up a lot of moisture and produces heavy snow, that's what you're watching here in Buffalo, New York, picks up heavy, heavy snow. It just puts down, well, just amazing snowfall amounts. Now listen to this. Where this video was taken, they got an inch of snow. One mile down the road, this direction, under that heavy snow band, there was four feet of it hyper local snowfall from these incredible lake effect snowfall events beautiful to see here in these pictures hyper local snowfall and here's some pictures here from buffalo new york from this famous lake effect snowfall event just a couple of years ago you can see how deep the snow got yeah i bet that dog has to go to the bathroom and has no chance of getting outside here's one of my favorites too like what do you do right you wake up, you got to get the driveway shoveled, you open the garage door, and you can't go anywhere. What do you do with the snow? Do you bring it into the garage? I think you just stay home. Now, when it comes to famous U.S. blizzards, I'm going to take you back to 1888, the blizzard of 1888. We're going to talk about two blizzards from 1888 in this video. The first one is going to be the one that hit in New York City. One of the reasons why New York City no longer has above-ground communication lines or power lines is because of this blizzard. It was powerful. It produced 50 foot tall drifts. 50, that's five zero. 50 foot tall drifts. That means that the snow was drifting in downtown New York City up the sides of five story buildings. 
Uh, hundreds of people were killed. There were over 200 ships that were wrecked there that were at the port in New York City. And it was all said and done. This was one of the worst natural disasters ever in the United States. It changed the landscape of New York. And what was neat was this was one of the hand-drawn maps that was recovered after this event showing us the very low atmospheric pressure, 29 inches, inches of mercury. The low was here and the floor around it counterclockwise just like this, just like we've been learning. And right in through here where the pressure gradient was really, really tight, see how closely spaced the isobars are? That's where we had our blizzard conditions, right there in New York City. Chicago, you've been hit hard too. One of the most famous blizzards was in 1967. Now what was famous about this was that the forecast just a day before this blizzard hit was for four inches of snow. Instead, 24 inches of snow fell, that's two feet of snow, locking the city down. Over, I believe it was 800 city buses were locked down and 50,000 cars were stranded on Chicago streets. Uh, now, these are not parked cars, these were stranded cars. Some kids had to spend the night at school because they couldn't get home from it. Amazing to see that blizzard. By the way, history repeated itself in 2011. This is the Groundhog's Day blizzard that hit Chicago. You're looking here at Lakeshore Drive. Now, my question for you all is this. What do you do if you get stuck in your car in a blizzard? Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. This is very, very important. I can't believe that I still to this day hear stories about people that don't know what to do when they're in a vehicle and there's a blizzard. So listen up. If you're stuck like these folks are right here, do you see all the nearby buildings? It is okay if you can visibly see a building that you can take shelter in to abandon your car. If you cannot see it, stay in the car. Even in a big city like this, stay in the car. Now, what do you do if you stay in your car? Well, if you stay in your car, you need to make sure that you keep it warm enough inside there for you. So run the engine periodically. Don't keep it on all the time. You need to conserve gas, but run it periodically. You should be prepared. Keep a shovel in your car, like a collapsible shovel. Keep water. Keep high calorie food like granola bars and stuff like that. Keep matches. Keep a candle in there. And also make sure that when you go anywhere in winter that you have a nearly full tank of gas and you bring a fully charged cell phone. You see, in the United States right now, people don't get trapped in blizzard conditions for days and days and days. The longest I've heard of in the last decade is about 18 hours. This one location in Chicago where one semi driver was stuck for 18 hours. Still, you can sit in there, stay warm and wait it out. Now, imagine you're driving in some rural part of the United States, not here in Chicago, but in a rural part. And all of a sudden the blizzard is so fierce you cannot drive anymore. You pull over to the side of the road. Don't get out. I've said that now twice. Don't get out. Don't get out and start wandering around looking for some farmhouse nearby. You're going to get lost. You're going to freeze to death and die. And when the rescue vehicles come, they don't go searching for your wandering track through the middle of a field. They go searching for your car and you should be inside of it. You are allowed to get out of your car for one reason. And that one reason is to make sure that your tailpipe is clear. You see this car right here, its tailpipe is buried. If this person were to continue to run the car, the tailpipe would melt some of the snow underneath this snowpack here and would allow the exhaust gases to get underneath the car. Well, by running the air conditioning or the heater in this case, you'd be drawing that, well, that exhaust filled gas back into the car, which is full of carbon monoxide. What I don't ever want to hear happening again is people dying in their cars of carbon monoxide poisoning because they didn't clear the tailpipe away. That's the only reason why you're allowed to get out of your car. Clear the tailpipe away. By the way, one of uh, the great pictures that we got from the Chicago Tribune is this one right here. One of the city buses during the Groundhog's Day blizzard of 2011 was abandoned. They left the door open and the snow got in. One of, my, one of my former students actually went and took her little sister and went and sat inside of it, took a picture inside of it. So I love this picture uh, from Nicole uh, showing her little sister inside of that snow. Now, this was the next day after the blizzard was done. All right, what does it take to get us a blizzard? Let's walk through this. Blizzards in the north central, yes, we're going to focus on blizzards in the north central United States because that is the place across the U.S. that has the most frequent blizzards. It all boils down to geography. When it comes to geography, it's about the mountains and the cold Canadian air. You see, the Rocky Mountains are large. They stick up high into the atmosphere and they block warm, moist air from the Pacific Ocean. As they block that air, they also up channel down from the Arctic. You know, we're talking up here in Canada. Really, really cold air. We need the cold air in place to give us, well, 
the strong winds, the cold air for the snow that we're going to need to get on the backside of a low pressure system to make a blizzard. Now, why is that air so cold? Well, Canada in winter has very long nights. The sun only comes out for a few hours. You get very strong cooling at night because of the clear skies and the long hours of night. What does that all result in? Well, that gives you this big dome of dense cold air that forms a high pressure system. And that high pressure system, which is seen right here, see it? is crucial to giving you the winds you need to make a blizzard. Now, even the middle of summer, get to the far northerly latitudes, the sun doesn't get very high in the sky. This is a picture called Sun Run, showing you the position of the sun every single hour for a 24-hour time period. Even in the middle of summer, it's still cold in these far uh, northern regions of our planet, simply because the sun, even though it's out all the time, doesn't get very high in the sky. In winter, though, you may only see it for a couple of hours a day. Now, what does all this result in? It results in the development of an ETC. Now, what is that? Extra tropical cyclone, a big winter storm. And it's the contrast, make sure you see that, the contrast between the high pressure system and the low pressure system that gives us a strong PGF. So here's another abbreviation. PGF stands for pressure gradient force. Remember learning about that? It's the gradient in these black lines, the isobars. You see, to make a blizzard, you have to have snow and wind. And there's a wind speed criteria, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Remember, when it comes to these big low pressure systems, it's thunderstorms down here to the south, heavy rain to the east, freezing rain and sleet to the northeast, and the blizzard on the backside. That's the transition of precipitation types around the low. So when we look for blizzards, it's on the northwest side of a low pressure system. All right? Those are your three ingredients. Now, when one comes together, look at this. Three different ways or four different ways of looking at it. Remember, our low pressure center is here. Here's the flow of air around it. We're going to be watching the back side for blizzards. Here it is in water vapor. See the dry slot right in through here? Here's the humid air getting wrapped around the back side. Here it is on radar. The low is right here. Thunderstorms rain. Freezing rain and sleet is there on the pinks. The blizzard is on the back side. And remember, the track of our low, this moment, just like this. Look where the winter storm warnings were and the blizzard warnings were on the northwest side. By the way, remember, if the low is right here to the south of it, the cold front comes down, that is a tornado watch box, which had some tornado warnings in it. This is all flood advisory. We have the winter storm stuff on the backside, including a blizzard warning right in through here. Remember, thunderstorms, rain, sleet, freezing rain, snow. That's the transition I want to make sure that you got down. Now, when it comes to these blizzards, let's take a look at the setup of the low pressure system. Remember, there's typically a cold front to the south and west and a warm front that goes off to the north and east. Well, on the back side, cold air, and on this side, warm moist air. Because the warm moist air is, is less dense, it runs right over the top of the cooler air, and you get your heaviest snow bands about 150 miles to the northwest of the low. We call it the wraparound region. That's the name, the wraparound region, because that is where the warm moist air wraps around the back side giving us the heavy snow bands. All right, remember this. Whenever we're trying to identify where the heavy snow bands are going to be, there's kind of a number I want you to remember, 150. You see, here's the track of a low pressure system. There was actually two over this time period. One went right down here and one went there. Where was the heaviest snow? About 150 miles to the northwest of the low. That's where they put out the risk for the heaviest snowfall events from this because the low went from here to there. So it's the northwest side of the low. Now here's something else neat to know about snow. When it comes to our, our big major weather systems like the Alberta Clipper or the Colorado Low, which are going to be the two systems that are going to be producing a lot of blizzard-like conditions in the northern plains, which is where we have the biggest and baddest blizzards, well, I want you to see these two numbers I've written down next to them. You can see I give the Alberta Clipper a high liquid to snow ratio, and I give the Colorado Low a low liquid to snow ratio. Now, what the heck is a liquid to snow ratio? Well, you might have heard at one point that, well, if it's winter time and uh, you get one inch of rain, well, that would be equivalent to 10 inches of snow, right? It's a liquid, the rain, to snow, well, the snow, uh, ratio. One inch of liquid equivalent to a certain number of inches of snow. Now, the colder the air gets, the colder the air gets, the fluffier the snow will be. And the fluffier the snow is, the deeper it can get. So the really cold air with the Alberta Clipper gives us a high liquid to snow ratio. It's all about temperature. The colder it gets, the bigger the ratio. So that means for one inch of liquid equivalent, you might get 15 inches of snow. 
When it comes to the Colorado low, because it's so much closer to the moisture coming out of the Gulf of Mexico, we have a much smaller liquid to snow ratio. It's one to eight. One inches of liquid gives you eight inches of snow. That's because the snow is heavier, it's got more liquid water content, and therefore it can compress down when it hits the ground. The colder the air, write this down, the colder the air, the higher the ratio. Now, why do we come up with these numbers? Well, when we use our numerical models to predict the weather, they only predict the total amount of water. We can convert it to a snowfall amount by using one of these ratios. The colder the air, the higher the ratio. In the United States, the location that has the most frequent blizzards, the location that has the most frequent blizzards is going to be North and South Dakota and Minnesota. Two blizzards per year on average, and that is a lot. There's a great book written about this area. It's called The Children's Blizzard, and they discuss in there how the northern plains are the perfect battleground for some of the world's most severe weather. In summer, there's huge anvil-top thunderstorms that produce massive globes of hail, tornadoes, and incredible amounts of lightning. In fall, it often gets very dry and wildfires catch, or large swarms of insects like locusts used to race across the northern plains. In winter, the blizzard can inflict such pain on beasts like animals that roam around. They, they can literally freeze in their tracks. And they've even seen sometimes where the cold air comes in so fast from Canada that any standing water can actually freeze into little waves. It freezes that fast. The Northern Plains, the battleground for weather in the United States. Now, the East Coast gets its fair share of massive winter storms as well. Check out this forecast from a storm that hit back in 2016, went right up the East Coast. They called it Snowzilla. Now, what I want you to remember is this. The low pressure system started in Mississippi, went through Alabama, Georgia, North and South Carolina, and off the East Coast. Where was the heaviest snow forecast? To the north of the track of the low. Now, they were projecting for parts of Washington, D.C. in excess of three feet of snow from this. Here was the system. It's playing out beautifully from what I taught you. Look at it. Severe storms to the south. Heavy rain to the east. See the pinks? That's sleet and freezing rain. On the backside, that's our blizzard. It's exactly like we've been covering. Now, this is what the snowfall looked like as it piled up near Washington, D.C. Look at this. Oh my gosh, just eventually, look at this, it's going to go right over the top of the camera. This was a monstrous, monstrous blizzard. Downtown Washington, D.C., well, nobody was fighting over parking spots this day because nobody could move their cars. There's a solid foot and a half of snow in the middle of the streets. Haymarket, Virginia, near Washington, D.C., that's just a drift. There's nothing under that, just a massive drift of snow between the houses, 10 feet tall. Here you go in Centerville, uh, uh, Virginia, still piling up over the windows. Here are some people that tried to go out in it. Like, what's the point? You're not going to ever get to your car. Don't, she just went out to dug through this, but never get to the car. I love this little kid here. Goes outside here in Maryland. What's he going to do? You know, the snow drift is taller than him up against his car. And this guy in West Virginia, well, I don't know why you bothered to go out to your car because once you get out there, you're not going to be able to drive it anyway. But maybe it's just something to accomplish. I love these people. They all lifted their windscreen wipers. These are the windshield wipers so that they wouldn't stick to the windshield. Who cares when you've got several feet of snow sitting on top of that in Maryland? And check this out. That's JFK Airport in New York City. Yeah, that's right. The snow drifts were over the tops of the aircraft. Incredible to see that. There was a famous picture that came out of Central Park, New York, of a nun that went sledding. What was famous about it? Everyone could see up her skirt, so we'll get on beyond this one. And I want you to see this video. These guys were actually breaking the law. There's a law against doing this in downtown New York City. But they went out, uh, towed behind a Jeep. Uh, you got the, your, your uh, skiing, and they're also um, they're also there on their snowboards, and they decided to post this on YouTube. I'd, somehow they got away with us without a fine and didn't get in trouble. Look at that. They're passing a plow. That's incredibly dangerous. They should not be doing this, but at least it's funny to watch, okay? Along the coast, look at the coastal beach erosion. That's ocean water thrust inland by the circulation around the low. Incredible to see the ice chunks floating in there. That's a lot of flood damage. Here, by the way, is some of the damage along the beach. The beach was washed away by the strong winds and big waves along this big low pressure system. I love this animated gif here of this cat desperately trying to get outside, just scratching away at the snow. These drifts piling up against the doors. Someone did this, which is fantastic. Kind of drew the Godzilla eating this, uh, this car here on the side. Just some great things we got out of this. And I want to show you one last, uh, well, not one last video, but one last video from this event. I titled it Swimming. This girl didn't get to go to her swim meet, so she decided to swim in the snow. Go. 
okay, don't ever, ever, ever do this. She's lucky she didn't break her neck when she dumped in there. But it just shows you what happens when you get that much snow in a place in the United States. It doesn't usually get three feet of snow. Now, the Weather Channel is notorious for covering these events. And I love this video of Mike Seidel, one of my favorite meteorologists. Just watch this one, okay? I think Mike missed out on a crucial part of his uh, of his childhood. Snow, compared to average, it's been plenty cold. And there's your March snowfall again. We're going to be above average. And one more time, Paul and Alexander, I just want to show you what happens when you throw this snow up. Well, you can get a sense of how it's blowing around here. And boy, I tell you what, and this is what's going on across all of these rural areas and even in the cities and towns here in the upper Midwest tonight. Blowing snow, drifting snow, and many highways are shut down. Hey, Mike, I really got to wonder, what would a snow angel look like in winds uh, this strong? Compared to hazard uh, let me see. I, well, you know, the problem, the problem with the snow angel here is that we don't have enough snow. So if I did a snow angel and fell back, I'd probably, but I can, oh, how about right here? I can do one right here. There we go. All right, Mike Seidel taking it for the team. Okay, tonight. okay. Mike, what are you doing? That is not how you make a snow angel. You don't flip your arms up. Remember, your legs go back and forth and your arms go back and forth. I don't know what the heck he's doing, but the Weather Channel usually does phenomenal coverage of these blizzards. Now, my favorite Weather Channel meteorologist has got to be Jim Cantori, and he has actually witnessed something called thunder snow. Check this out. Whoa! Was that lightning? Christina, what? we just had a thunder snow. We just had a, a lightning strike and thunder here in Worcester. Okay, thunder snow. Now, this wasn't the only time he's ever seen this. Check this one out. I heard it was a bus spin out plus cars are, are uh... Oh, oh, Jesus! Listen to that! This is during the Groundhog's Day blizzard. A... That's unbelievable! <laughs> oh, my goodness! Holy smoke! Just incredible! Robbie! Twice in one storm, baby! Okay. Now, here's another one. Check this one out. Drew, my, my, my producer, uh, Tom Winter, who I'm glad they gave me a guy with the last name of Winter here, uh, tells me now the power outages are up to 18,000 uh, statewide and through here. So in, in terms of damage, I mean, are you seeing big limbs or just small limbs that are kind of sitting on power lines? Well, we're, we're talking significant limbs oh. of trees coming down. The snow is just pulling. We just had, we just had, guys, we just had thunder. We just had thunder here. That is the fourth time, that is the fourth time I have witnessed thunder snow during a live shot. This is tremendous. That's going to be in the Guinness Book of World Records. Drew, uh, did you hear that through my microphone? Absolutely. You could absolutely hear that so loud there. You could just tell the conditions of how rapidly it's an indicator of how rapidly the snow is I just coming need down. a moment. I, I, I just need a moment. Wow. Wow. That's just unbelievable. Drew, thanks for helping us out here. <laughs> okay. So Drew, Jim Cantori, oh, pretty... better pause there. Do, uh, Jim Cantori here just getting you with thunder. Now, what is thunder snow? Let's talk about this, okay? I'll draw up here because it's kind of blank. Check this out. We learned earlier when we talked about thunderstorms. I'm trying to draw one real quick for you. The thunderstorms have the big anvil on top that look like this, right? What did we learn? Negative charges accumulate at the bottom and positive charges accumulate at the top. You remember ice. Ice is the crucial ingredient. Now, in order to get charge separation, we have to have a huge updraft. Now, this is what winter time, I'm sorry, summertime clouds look like. They develop vertically. In winter, so let's draw the ground here. Whoa, that was a weird drawing. Those, well, our ground slopes, okay? In winter time, our, our clouds typically form as big sheets like this. They tend to form as big sheets. They, they don't often form vertically. But what we found is in these big winter storms, occasionally, we can get these clouds to all of a sudden pop up and make thunderstorm like, well, like clouds in them. And you get charge separation and you get lightning. And we get lightning and thunder in the middle of these major winter storms. And it's rare to get it. But when it happens, let me tell you something. I guarantee you when you hear uh, thunder snow, you are in an area that you're getting heavy, heavy, heavy snowfall out of this. So just a quick drawing up here to kind of show you what's going on here. All right, we're going to skip that guy in the bottom right. I just want to show you a funny video. One of my students took this video a couple of years ago. This is Springfield Avenue at the University of Illinois. And I'm, my point of telling these videos, don't mess with the CUMTD bus drivers. Are you ready? Check it out. Yes. <laughs> There's a bus. The bus 
<laughs> okay, do you see the snowman? Watch what's going to happen. Okay, so the, the bus driver came over and hit the snowman. Now, it's funny to watch this, but I'm going to tell you something. That bus driver lost his job. He swerved into oncoming traffic in the other lane, knocked out a snowman, and then went back over into his lane. Now, who makes snowmen? Mostly children. And therefore, um, he was asked to resign uh, because uh, rather than have, I think, charges put against him for this, uh, for doing this. And so uh, just just be careful uh, when, you, when you see when you see stuff like this. Don't don't ever uh, don't ever do this again uh, because you can get in trouble. But just an amazing video here. All right. Let's talk about this. What are the criteria you need to get a blizzard? Now, I've shown you a lot of crazy video with snow, but let me tell you something. You don't have to have a certain snowfall amount. Look at the four criteria. This has got to have falling or blowing snow. That's right. The snow doesn't have to be falling from the sky. It could be blowing off the ground to give you a blizzard. But you got to have snow. The winds that blow it got to be at least 35 miles an hour. That's 30 knots. And it must be able to reduce the visibility to a quarter mile or less. Now, here's the kicker with all of this. You can have, for a moment... Snow falling, 35 mile an hour winds, plus visibility reduced to a quarter mile or less. That may last for 10 minutes, an hour maybe. But it has to at least last for three hours or be forecast to last for at least three hours to be considered a blizzard. Which means you can have temporary whiteout conditions without being blizzard. You have to have all of these things coming together, these th top three criteria lasting for three straight hours. Now I'm going to tell you this. I know that I stressed a lot that the thing that will kill you the most is wet and icy pavement. Remember we talked about that. 1.4 million car accidents, 7,000 fatalities a year in these car accidents blamed on wet and icy pavement. So that's, that's dangerous. But when it comes to deaths due to cold, due to hypothermia, we have to talk about this, okay? Now your body must maintain a temperature, 98.6. That's the average human body temperature. You can't survive for very long when you get much above 105 or 106 degrees Fahrenheit. At that, we're talking lethal body temperature. So our bodies are very sensitive to warm and they're very, very sensitive to cold. Now, how does your body lose heat? It can lose it by conduction. You can touch something that's cold and it will conduct heat away from your skin. You can lose it by radiation. Your skin is constantly radiating away heat. You can also lose it by convection. The air can blow off the top of your skin, cooling you off. And you can also lose heat. And we learned about this back when talking about water in the atmosphere. You can lose it by evaporation. Ignoring evaporation, we've come up with an equation. It's down there at the bottom of that chart that gives us something called the wind chill. Now, what is the wind chill? Well, the wind chill is found by matching a temperature to a wind speed. Let's imagine, like I've shown you here, that the temperature outside is minus 10 with a wind speed of five miles an hour. The wind chill temperature is minus 22. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that your skin will cool at the same rate if it was minus 22 degrees and no wind. It'll cool at the same rate if it's minus 10 with a five mile an hour wind. Now, look at this. If the temperature was five and the wind speed was 40, the wind chill is still 22. So if it's warmer at 5 degrees Fahrenheit and there's a 40 mile an hour wind, your skin still cools at that same rate, the equivalent of minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit with no wind. So this is an apparent temperature. It tells you how quickly your skin cools. And the National Weather Service says anything less than minus 18 degrees Fahrenheit is, quote, a dangerous situation. Why? Well, look at the color coding. This color represents skin freezing in 30 minutes. This color represents skin freezing in 10 minutes. And this color represents skin freezing in five minutes. Now, very quickly, this is what happens when your skin freezes. It's called frostbite. And I think we've seen enough of that. Let's come back to this figure. Now, I want to tell you a very quick story. You see, at the beginning of this lecture, I talked about the blizzard of 1888 that hit New York City. That blizzard happened in March. But let's rewind the clock a little bit and go back to January of 1888. 
You see, there was a blizzard that hit North and South Dakota, parts of Nebraska, parts of Minnesota, the northern plains of the United States. The people that lived there were migrants. They had come here to the United States from northern Europe, promised land on the Homestead Act, and where did we send them? To the northern plains of the United States, one of the toughest places to live in the U.S. While there, they had to live in Saudis. These are houses made out of earth. And they had wood planked homes, but they couldn't live in them during winter because the winds and the cold were so fierce and those wood planked homes were so poorly insulated they couldn't stay there. Well, while they were there, just to let you know, men, an old man, a man who had lived a full life, was probably 45 or 50 years old. That was old age for a man back then. Women, well, a lot of women back in this time period would have 10 or 12 children with maybe only half of them reaching adulthood. But these people came to the Northern Plains on the promises of the Homestead Act to bring a new and bright future to their lives and to their families. And when they got there, they met the blizzard. Now, from November through December and through parts of January, the Northern Plains in 1887 and 1888 were locked into very cold and snowy conditions. And because of that, several children had not had an opportunity to go to school for several weeks. But on one day, January 12th, 1888, the temperatures climbed all the way up to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was melting the snow. The sun was out and it was bright. And school children all over the Northern Plains begged their parents to allow them to go back to school. And they did. Now, this is one thing I don't fully understand about these pioneer uh, towns in the Northern Plains. The schoolhouses were always about a mile away from the main village. So all the kids ran out of their houses, not wearing their normal winter clothes, and ran off to school. It was a warm day to a pioneer child. 40 degrees in the middle of winter is like shorts and t-shirt weather, okay? There was one little boy named Walter I want to tell you a story about. Walter woke up that morning and his parents saw it. Remember, that's a house made out of earth. And he asked his mom, Mom, can I go to school? And she was reluctant, but she finally let him go. You see, Walter was a a row monitor. In other words, he was in charge of his row. And when he uh, ran out of his room, he didn't bring his winter coat, no gloves, no hat. He didn't even wear his his over his over uh, like coat and his over his, his heavy pants. Didn't even wear his big boots. Just ran off. It was a warm day for them. On his way out, he grabbed his most prized possession, which was a perfume bottle given to him by his mother, who was given to her by her grand, uh, by his grandmother. And what Walter kept in it was, per, uh, was um, not perfume, but water. Because when he went to school and he would write on his piece of slate, he would spray water from it onto the slate to wipe it off. Well, Walter and bunches of other school kids got to school that day. And when they got there, everything was great. They hadn't seen each other in weeks. But around noon... The school teacher and the children looked out to the northwest and saw racing from the Canadian prairies, butted up against the Rocky Mountains, forced southward on strong northerly winds, the leading edge of a powerful cold front, draped to the south of a powerful Alberta clipper. The leading edge of that cold front was moving at 40 miles an hour. Behind it, the winds at times were well over 60 miles an hour, and it produced a snow that had a high liquid to snow ratio, 1 to 25, which means the snow looked like blowing diamond dust. It looked like smoke. And it was racing toward the schoolhouse, and the teacher had to make a decision. Do I keep the kids here, or do I make them run home immediately? Well, the snow was coming at them so fast she couldn't make a decision. And what happened is Walter's little school, completely engulfed in a blinding blizzard. They say that the snow was so thick that a grown man could not see the tips of his fingers of his outstretched hand. And shouting in snow like this with wind, you wouldn't be able to hear much beyond about 10 feet. The kids were trapped. Now, if you've ever been to North and South Dakota, there are very few landmarks in the eastern halves of those states. It's very flat. It's wide open prairies, which means there's not tree rows. There's not fences. There's not stuff that you can use as a benchmark to know where you are. And those kids were trapped. Now, luckily, some of the fathers in the nearby village hitched up a couple of horses and somehow found their way to the, to the schoolhouse. I don't know how, but they did. And when they got there, all the kids went racing outside to get on the back of this wagon. Walter, being a row monitor, well, he waited till everybody in his row was on like a good leader should. And then when he ran out and got on the back of the wagon, the wagon started going back to the town. And then when the wagon got about 60 feet away, Walter remembered his perfume bottle full of water. If he leaves it inside the school, the school, the air inside there's going to freeze and the water will freeze. And when the water freezes, it expands. And when it expands, it's going to break the perfume bottle. So Walter jumps off the back, runs back inside, grabs the perfume bottle, comes right back out. And when he gets out, 
He can't see anything. He's blinded by the snow. Walter's body, by the way, was experiencing temperatures that had already dropped to zero. And the wind speeds, 55 miles an hour. So his wind chill was way down here at minus 32, right down there. And it got worse and worse and worse. Walter got lucky. He turned right and he started to run with all of his might. But Walter was a pioneer boy. He was young. He was fit, which means he didn't have a whole lot of extra fat to keep him insulated. Without his hat, his gloves, his heavy overcoat, his boots, his heavy pants, Walter began to run and his body temperature went from 98.6 down to 96. And Walter began to go through the first stage of hyperthermia. Now, what does that feel like? Walter's first reaction, violent shivering. You see, that's the body's defense. Rhythmically twitch the muscles, violently shiver them. Use them as a way to generate heat, to consume oxygen, to consume the, the food, the fuel. But you do this at a terrible expense. You see, when you start to shiver, it's your body's first defense against the cold. It's trying to warm you back up, but you can only do it for a little while. You run out of energy very quickly. Shivering can consume up to three times your normal amount of oxygen. So it's a temporary solution. Walter's body temperature in the first stage of hyperthermia, well, his shivering was uncontrollable. When his body temperature dropped to 93 degrees, Walter settled into moderate hyperthermia. At that point, his body said, stop shivering. Pull the blood back in toward the heart, toward the internal organs in the middle of the body, and toward the brain. Keep those things functioning. If you would have asked Walter to make a fist, he couldn't do it. His calves began to lock up because he didn't have blood through them. He got massive cramps, and his kidneys went into overtime. Walter wet his pants because his body was trying to filter all the blood it was bringing back toward the middle part of his, of his chest and, and, and his stomach. And as that happened, Walter fell to the ground. He'd only made it 200 yards. When he fell to the ground, Walter's little ungloved hand fell on a frozen mud track, leading him back to the village. And so he crawled another 200 yards with his hand in this frozen track beneath the snow. And as Walter continues to follow that mud track back toward town, his body temperature dropped into the low 90s and into the upper 80s. And at that point, Walter's body shuts down. It goes into this preservation mode. Slow down the breathing. Slow down the heartbeat preserve brain function. If Walter's parents would have showed up, he wouldn't have recognized them. He would have begun to hallucinate. Walter's body was slowly shutting itself down. Walter's temperature dropped into the upper 80s and into the mid 80s, where he's now in life-threatening hypothermia. And at one last moment, Walter, still a long ways from home, remembered something that his dad had taught him. His dad said, son, listen, if you are ever caught out and you have no shelter, protect yourself from the wind. If you have no other shelter but the snow, bury yourself in it. Get out of the wind. And that's what Walter did. He found a two-foot-tall snowdrift and tucked himself in it. When he did that, he left one little ungloved hand sticking up above the snow so that if his dad or his mom came out looking for him, they might see his little hand up there and rescue him. Walter's temperature continued to drop into the low 80s and into the 70s, and his heartbeat continued to slow down, such that it was now beating once every 10 seconds, maybe once every 30 seconds. And he slowly let his temperature drop colder and colder, and he spent a day in the snow. The next day, his parents came running toward the school because the other kids had said, Walter jumped off. And they went back there and they saw his little ungloved hand frozen, sticking above the snow. And Walter's dad grabs his son. His mother wants to take him back and throw him into a hot bath, bring that boy's temperature up and revive him. But what Walter's dad first was rip off his son's clothes and put his ear right up to his son's chest. And he waited. And he was waiting for one thing, one beat of his son's heart. And he heard it. And he waited again, and there was another. His son's internal temperature was incredibly low. But he was still alive. Walter's dad raced his son back to their house, but didn't put him in the bath. Instead, he took off his own clothes, took off all of his son's clothes, and for two hours, melted the snow between his son's body and his body, using his own body heat to revive his son. 
slowly is the way you want to do this. If you shock your system back into, well, warmer conditions, the blood will quickly flow from the interior of the body out to the extra where it will get trapped in the constricted blood vessels and never return, and you'll die. But Walter's dad knew what to do. And slowly, over two hours, using his own body heat to warm his son back up, his son's body temperature began to climb. And when it got into the lower 90s again, Walter's heartbeat was beating much faster, and he opened his eyes and saw his dad. And at that moment, Walter handed, or Walter was handed over to his mother, who went inside, and then he got in the bath and warmed up. Walter lived to be 96 years old. Walter's, uh, Walter here wrote a part of the end of the book I'm telling you about. It's called The Children's Blizzard of 1888, a phenomenal, blizzard about, a phenomenal story about a blizzard where people had to survive. It's an incredible, incredible story. Just to tell you how blinding the blizzards were, after the blizzard of 1888, people that lived in the Great Plains would string rope between their houses and their barns so that if they got stuck out in the blinding snow, they could put their hands up high and walk back and forth until their hand would hit the rope and then they can follow the rope back to the house. That's because they couldn't see the house. It was such a blinding snow. Walter was lucky. There were many stories of other kids who didn't survive this. Now, I've taught you a lot of amazing things this semester about being safe, surviving severe weather. You know who I want to be in this story? I want to be Walter's dad. <laughs> what a great guy. I want you all to listen to me like Walter listened to his dad because I've taught you how to stay safe. The blizzard is a formidable beast and it kills you with the cold. Don't forget that. When the National Weather Service says it's dangerous below minus 18, your body can lose heat so quickly that you may go into hypothermia and not survive. Never mind parts of you might freeze. And with that, I think I'll wrap up this lecture on blizzards.